All right. Sorry for the delay. <coughs> Welcome back. What I need, I need like the radio DJs. I need some bumper music to kind of ease me in here. Uh, so yeah, I guess there are a few people working on Joust still. Uh, so I guess I'm, I'll take some questions on that. You wanna, you wanna ask me any questions about that? Yes. Uh, so the question is regarding make files and uh, asking for a little bit of guidance on that. And are there similarities to the date time one? And the answer is yes, absolutely, there are similarities. So let me go ahead and talk about <coughs> what we need to do in a make file. How about, let me start with make notes. Uh, for each .cpp file, you should have a compile line. <clears throat> for example, G++ minus C myfile.cpp. Uh, have a compile line with the dash C option. Okay. The dash C option will compile the file to a dot O that is a machine readable format. Uh, that, however, you cannot execute. Two, you have to, you must specify the make rule. No, I'll put that in quotes. I don't know why, but I will. Uh, you must specify the make rule for compiling each .cpp to a dot .o. That rule is what you want colon what is used to make what you want. So in the case of compiling my file .cpp, what is it that I want? based on number one. I want a dot O. So give me, so I, I can't just write dot O, tell me exactly what I want using my example. Exactly, I want to make my file dot O. Colon, what is used to make it? Well, we know that we need my file dot CPP. And then you need to Mentally, if you don't have it memorized, you need to physically open up myfile.cpp and find what files are included because whatever files are included is part of what is used to make myfile.o. So there's probably, yeah, so that we can't know for sure because I'm making this up as I go along, but myfile.h is reasonable based on how we've been structuring these things. And then there'd be the, and then there is the tab followed by the G++ minus C myfile.cpp, right? <clears throat> so talking out loud then, what CPP files? We have weapon.cpp. So we are going to have to create a weapon.o. We're going to need a weapon.cpp to create it, and we're going to need a weapon.h to create it, right? We have a knight.cpp. How, uh, what is it that we want to create from knight.cpp? We want to create a knight.o and the files that are going to be required to create a knight.o are knight.cpp, knight.h and if you look in there 
weapon.h because you are using a weapon as part of the knight class. Yes, the weapon in hand? Yes, question. But in the, uh, the weapon.o, you're also going with the, the random.h. Mm. Oh, yeah. Excellent, excellent point, yes. So in uh, stepping back to weapon.o, it's going to need weapon.cpp, weapon.h, and because you are using the random number generator, you need random.h. Because you'll have pound include random.h in there somewhere. You'll have it either in weapon.cpp or in weapon.h, right? So you, you do need to know it could be included in either one of those. Yes, question? Uh, so the .o, the .o files are um, just the cpp. You only need those two for .o's, not the .h. This follows the rule that you never, ever, 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 and I'll say it one more time, ever compile a .h file. Because when you pound include it, a copy of that file is included for the compiler. Uh, if you see, if you look at <clears throat> your directory and you see something that looks like that, okay, that's a sure sign that you tried to compile a header file. And this, this, create, this has, in the past, created literally hours of debugging headaches for people because they accidentally compiled the header file. They get the, their head screwed on straight and realize, oh, I don't want to do that. And then they spend the next few hours, in my example here, playing with weapon and can't get the darn thing to work right. And what happens is, uh, in the future, when you try to pound include weapon.h, what it's going to do is it's going to see the existence of this .gch, and it's going to use that instead. So make changes all day long to weapon.h. It'll never get used. It's just going to use this GCH file that you compiled back on Tuesday, All right? So the general, so never ever ever compile a .h file. Should you happen to accidentally compile it, do a directory listing. If you have a GCH file, remove everything that ends in .gch. Okay, get rid of them. They'll cause all sorts of troubles. Uh, so we need we so we've got. Uh, weapon.cpp, uh, given the, the reminder here that weapon needs to deal with random.h, we have to compile random.cpp. So we have one of these rules for turning random.cpp into random.o, and that will need random.cpp and random.h. Then we go up to knight. Knight needs the weapon.h and the knight.h plus the source file. And then we get to the main program where main is, right? And you're going to need to know about night in main, so it's going to have to be uh, have night.h in there. Yes? Does it matter what file you put them in the main file? As far as the .o files, no, it doesn't matter the order you put them in. However, generally speaking, you go from big to small, okay? Uh, meaning uh, that that includes more things go higher up, and that that includes fewer things goes lower down. So I suppose you could put night, or excuse me, you'd put, yeah, you'd put night, then weapon, then random. That would be biggest to smallest, right? Random only knows about random. Weapon knows about weapon and random. Night knows about night, weapon, and random. Uh, the most important thing is, so that's one and two. <clears throat> I'll, I'll leave these notes here. This will be a bit confusing for people to look at it out of context, but uh, I'll leave it there anyway. Um, the third thing is you must turn all of your .o files into an executable, which means I am going to do all of my .o files. I won't write it like that. You're going to have to compile my file .o your file dot o, his file dot o, her file dot o, uh, and random dot o. Okay. If you want your executable to be named something other than a dot out, which when you're using make files you usually do want it to be named something else, don't forget the dash o option. So that becomes, I come here, I copy paste all this, 
somewhere in here. I can either put it at the end or the beginning. I'll put it at the end. Um, my project. For, write a rule for this. I copy this, I paste it. The rule is, what is it that I'm creating? My project, what files are required for it? All the dottos, right? So I'm just going to, uh, let's see, I'll copy that. Whoops, wrong place, right there. This goes at the top. So uh, this rule and accompanying G++ line should be the first rule. Uh, six, a nicety. Perhaps add a rule to clean up the mess. Clean, in order to clean, you don't have to specify what it requires. And then I can just say remove all the .o files and the executable. Uh, I'll also do it with the dash f. The dash f suppresses any complaints. So normally if I run clean twice, the first time it would clean things up, the second time it would complain, it would complain that there are no .o files and no my project file. If you put the dash f, it suppresses any complaints. So just another nicety on top of niceties. Okay, does that help? Yeah. All right. Other questions? Yes? I don't really get the weapon in hand portion of night.h. Uh, don't get the weapon in hand portion of night.h. Okay, so what I will do for that is... Let's see, let's see what this shows us. Uh, okay, so this is the one with the question mark, but it's, it's sufficient. And I think I want to draw, so give me a few seconds to hook up my little tablet thing in here. So uh, let, let me take a step back. I want to I want to kind of introduce this with a bit of a wider conversation that uh, I probably covered insufficiently. The purpose of doing this sequence diagram. Actually, let me take a step back and go even further. This country was founded. No way. Um, <clears throat> When, you, when you're in a lot of courses, computer science courses, like a software engineering course, they'll say, we're going to go through the steps of software engineering, so you have to be sure and have an analysis documented and a design documented before you get to coding. And nobody does that. What, you know what everyone does? Everyone goes and codes up their project, and then they grumble, and they go back, and they do all the documentation afterward. And, and so in a software engineering class, you may have to do a sequence diagram. And after your program's done, you'll go back and try doing the sequence diagram, okay? Uh, and that's because you can get away with it. And it, and uh, I think following the axiom, you shouldn't have to do it if there's a reason to do it. All right, if you don't have to do the damn diagram, don't do it until the last minute, right? 
that's not why you're being shown this. The reason the sequence diagram is being provided is that it is a problem solving tool. Okay? You should, when you're doing a real project, you should be have, assuming you don't use a computer based tool, you'll have uh, a stack of paper and you'll have a pencil and you'll do like 30 of these things trying to figure out what it is your program's supposed to do depending on the complexity. It could be far less than 30. And the idea is it's so much easier to kind of talk through this with someone else and draw the lines and so forth and go, this isn't going to work at all, and then throw that away. That's far easier than spending 30 hours coding to find out it doesn't work. Now you throw away 30 hours of code and start all over again. You do that four or five times. Okay, So it's supposed to be a time saver and, and help you ferret out some of this information. Now we're all a little bit still hazy on this and and it, it may be a little bit hazy on how you haven't done it enough to be proficient at it so I get it if you're a little bit worried that you're not sure how to use it that's fine this is 111 I'm introducing it to you I just want you to start to get familiar and comfortable with it so when I come here and I start to become proficient with it uh, let me reiterate what this diagram reveals to us it reveals to us, one, the member functions that will exist in a class for this particular sequence. So I have, even though I have objects up here, you and I both know that this is random class. We know that this is the weapon class, that this is the weapon class, and, and that this is night. Oops and that this is night. And anywhere I see a solid arrowhead, or a solid line, the arrowhead points to the class that has that function. So here is main, when we had our role play up at the front of the room, turned to the knight on either the right or the left and asked the question, are you exhausted? That's the way this looks in a sequence diagram. And now we can say that, aha, the night class must have an are you exhausted function. Okay? And the reason I did the role play with the people up here is that it's much more visceral and it was, it was fairly easy for us to follow. If I'd started with this diagram, this is much more abstract. So the idea is that you begin to mentally be able to, in your mind, have the little people doing the role play, but in fact all you're doing is diagramming. So in the future you draw this line, are you exhausted, and you mentally see Wes turning to the side and asking the question, right? Uh, and then we describe what happens and then we say what that function returns. So we get that the arrowhead ends at night, therefore this must be a member function of night and it's being called, are you exhausted? Is any information provided in the context of the role play that we saw up here, or hopefully in the future we'd do in our head, we'd think, no, when Maine asked the question, are you exhausted? No information was provided, right? Are you exhausted? And, oh, by the way, here's an apple. And, but the question was asked, and then Maine sat there patiently and was given an answer back, which was true and false. So we get the name of the function, any parameters to the function, which is none in this case, and the kind of thing that's given back, which is a Boolean. Okay, And where does the function begin? It begins where the arrowhead is. Where does the function end? It ends where we have the dashed line. We can look at wield, and the, uh, we see that wield goes to night. So the night class must have a wield function. It begins here. It ends here. And this is, in essence, a kind of a step-by-step -step of what happens in the wield function. <clears throat> uh, yes, question in the so, back. For example, um, you're in May, you're going to come to the, the function call for are you exhausted? It's going to go to the, the night.h to the, the class uh, calculation, and then that's going to go to the night.cpp for the definition. So the question is, uh, when you have, for instance, this are you exhausted, you said, so it goes to the night.h and finds that, and then goes to the CPP and finds the source there and runs it. Um, I wouldn't quite phrase it that way, <clears throat> so I, I'll be a little bit more exacting in the information. The, the header files 
never uh, characterize something that's done. Okay, the header file uh, is just information for the compiler that you may or may not use. In other words, once the compiler is done compiling, anything in those header files goes out the window. All right. So what the cleverness about the header file is, is when we write a, an are you exhausted function for night, the header file provides the information to make sure we write the function the quote right way. We're going to write a function right in night.h. In night.h, I'm going to say, uh, so I have class night. And somewhere here, I'm going to have, I'm going to, we know this function returns Boolean. We know it's called are you exhausted, and it takes no information. That's just telling the compiler that when we write this function that I'm following these rules. So down, down in, in night.cpp. Returns a boolean. It's a function that belongs to the night class. It's called "Are you exhausted?" Uh, so the so this this information here is just making sure that I write this information correctly. No, it's not the constructor. This is just a, a member function. Uh, so if I'm to characterize this. When I, in main, I'm going to have a ton of stuff. I'm going to say night k1. I'm going to give it five pieces of information. And then I'm going to say k1 dot r u exhausted. And, th and the line 16 is incomplete because I've got a this is inside a while loop, so I have a bunch of stuff happening in the condition of the while loop. But this is part of it. So what I would say is that what this is going to do on line 16 is it's going to call the code. Yikes! Where am I here? Uh, oh, for some reason I thought I had multiple files for a minute. Uh, it's going to call this code. And it's going to call this code using k1, right? So I'm going to do things with stamina here, right? We say if stamina is less than or equal to zero, dot dot dot. What what one part of what's hard to get your head around this is that lines seven through ten is written generically for the night class. And the, if you want to understand it better, the question, the smart question to ask is, on line 9, whose stamina are you talking about? Now that's intuitively obvious when we go back to the role play here, right? When Main turned to one of the knights, turned to Starry, and said, are you exhausted? Did anyone ever have any question about whose stamina Starry was going to look at? Starry basically flipped up that notepad and, and looked down, yes? Starry looks at his own stamina. So in line 9, even though it's written generically, as st if stamina is less than or equal to zero, the answer to whose stamina are we talking about, the answer is whoever was asked the question, are you exhausted? And that question is being asked on line 17. So what happened when Maine turned the other direction and asked Stormy, are you exhausted? Well, that was Stormy's stamina. And the way that would look like in code is maybe Stormy is K2. So on, on line 9, whose stamina are we talking about? When we hit line 17, we're talking about K1's stamina. And when we hit line 18, we're talking about K2's stamina. Yes. You don't need separate uh, functions for are you exhausted, right? They don't just the same one and then just apply them to each other. You do not need separate functions for the different nights. And that's another big confusion. People are starting to confuse the concept of class and object, and you need to get in your head straight that class is blueprint and object is house. You do not need two blueprints to create two houses. You need one blueprint to create a thousand houses, right? Does anyone question the fact that I can, I can 
be going here all day long and I can create night 98 and then dot 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 I can say K98 are you exhausted does anyone have any question in their mind that that is possible for me to do did I have to write did I have to write 92 of these functions no of course not I write one it's like a blueprint it's describing should I ever call this function using a night object this is how that night object should react so on line 22 it's going to be K9 excuse me I said 92 it's going to be K98's stamina that's being examined on line 9. So coming back to this diagram, that's what I, I, I think I said it before, this diagram ultimately really models quite closely the C++ code you're going to write. And that is the utility of this diagram. It helps you get a lot of very specific information about your, your class and your member functions and to a lesser extent the data you would have in that class uh, without ever writing any code. It takes a long time to get into Vim and bust out code. It takes hardly any time to sit here with a pencil and a piece of paper and bust this stuff out. And if it doesn't work, wad it up, throw it away, and try something else. Okay? That's what object-oriented analysis and design is. It's sitting around with your colleagues, busting out diagrams like this, trying to figure out what your application is supposed to do. You may find that uh, you know you need you need other class when you your first go at this you may end up putting out on a diagram like this you might put out night and night and you have weapon as part of night and you draw some of these arrows and boy it just isn't working out aha maybe we have to break weapon out into its own class let's create weapon a couple weapon objects as totally separate things and you put out lance and sword on here so even the existence of even determining what classes exist in your application changes as you do this diagram and it's an iterative process. Then you go back to describe, you go back to the other sheet of paper where you wrote down, I have a night class with these pieces of data, and I have a weapon class with these pieces of data, right? You're going back and forth and back and forth and figuring out what classes you need, what classes you don't need. Maybe the third time through, you actually had a Joust class, and pretty soon you're going, eh, I don't know, what's with this Joust class? Why don't we just have, put it all in main, since it's just a test program for the designers anyway, right? So that that's this joust class that you had for the first three iterations goes out the door and you don't even have that anymore for the next iteration of drawing this diagram. It's something for you to experiment with and figure stuff out. And once you're done and you got it, it is amazingly informative for writing C++ code. So now, the key thing that isn't well represented in this diagram uh, that needs to be resolved is how things are communicating with each other. So one thing that I, let me choose a different color. One thing that I know for sure based on this line right here, this are you exhausted line, I know that main has to communicate with a knight. And in fact, if I drew it all out, I would see that there are in fact two knights that main has to communicate with. How is that communication brought, made possible? And uh, the way it's made possible in this, w in this example is that we actually have main create a couple night objects. Once you create a couple night objects, or 98 night objects, then you can have main communicate with those two or 98 night objects. Let me stop saying 98. You can have it communicate with those two knights, right? By virtue of creating them as I've done on lines 15 and 16. So lines 15 and 16 is what allows these arrows to begin at this thick line out here, which is main, and communicate with either of the knights. So you'll have these solid arrows going from main to either of the knights. The next thing to note is that main never ever has an arrowhead going to weapon. So there's no need to have main create weapons, and main never communicates with weapons. Uh, we have, um, so let's, let's look at other communications that we have occurring. One, which is what I don't have on this diagram. Uh, don't save. Let's see.
that's the same one. Okay, so I just go up a day. To this one. Oh boy, let's see this one. All right, here we go. Uh, there are a couple other communications to resolve. One is to note this is the weapon, and note that there's a solid arrowhead going from weapon to Todd, and we know that Todd is actually random. Okay, so we know that weapon needs to communicate with random. We also know that the knight, based on this right here, gets stamina required, and based on did you hit, here's two examples of solid arrows going to, from knight to weapon. We know that knight needs to communicate with weapon, and we know that weapon needs to communicate with random. And now the question is, what is the nature of that communication? Uh, there end up being several ways of setting this up. I want to focus on the difference between uh, random and uh, having knight communicate with weapon. So first let me start with random. So this is in randoms did you hit function, right? It's inside of, excuse me, I'm misspeaking. I'm inside of weapons did you hit function is where the weapon communicates with random. So let me write a little bit of code here. This is weapons did you hit function. <clears throat> And inside this function, there has to be some sort of communication. If I did it literally like this, I'd probably write something like that. Uh, but I'll just say R. R represents some random object we've created. The question is, where should R be created, right? We can't use R before we create it. And we have two possibilities. Possibility one. And possibility two is okay. So it's a, this is a, a very important question, and it gets to a lot of uh, decisions being made in object-oriented analysis and design. And how do you decide which is more appropriate? Now, I need to back up first and ask the question, does everyone understand how if I do line 20, line 21 works? And does everyone also understand if I do line 13 that 21 works? Does anyone question that? Anyone want to ask for clarification on either of them? I've been trying to do it like line 20, and it says undefined reference to random. If you're getting an undefined reference to random, then that probably means that what you need somewhere at the top of your weapon.cpp. You do have it included. Uh -huh. uh, it's case sensitive. Make sure that it's an uppercase R right here on line 21. And I checked that. Okay. Uh, then I then in that case I'd show just show me the code and I'll help you figure that out. But usually when it's saying it's undefined or uh, doesn't know what it is, that generally means you don't you either have a typo or you haven't included the header file. Generally, <clears throat> all right. Um, here's here's how you you make a decision between line 14 and line 21. And this is what I had said last time, and it's a bit of a confusing concept when you're first exposed to it. The question is, are you concerned with the state of R between uses of R? Meaning, uh, 
it does by the state of R I mean it's inter the variables that it's holding internally do you need to preserve those now let me give you the, uh, an example of the answer being yes so if I come to with a totally different set of code here I have some code and here I have a while loop da 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 a whole bunch of stuff whatever uh, alright let's put it here Here's my while loop, and I'm going to say k1.wield dot dot dot. All right. I'm going to loop over and over and over again and have k1 wield the weapon, right? I'm using k1 on line 40. If I go one time through the loop and I use k1, the next time I'm through the loop, do I? is it important for me to know what the values of k1 were the first time I used it? Let me ask a different question. There are two ways for me to have done the role play up here. I could have gotten a whole bunch of volunteers to be knights, and I could have Wes turn to Starry and say, wield, right? And then it goes, da -da -da -da, and, and true or false comes back. And then I can say, okay, Starry, go sit down. Another volunteer, get up here, stand up here. Next time Wes goes, wield. Is that... What, what is your impression of me having done that? And that other person has their own clipboard with their own values on it. It's not right because what is happening every time that Maine is asking Starry to wield? What part of that night is changing? Right, the, the whole night generally, but specific, one, an example of one specific thing is the stamina, the, the knight's stamina, right? Every time you ask that knight to wield a weapon, that knight is stamina, it's going down, yes? So if I ask a knight to wield and then I throw that knight away and I put another knight up here and say wield and throw that knight away and ask another knight to stand up here and say wield, you see how you've lost continuity to the application, that it's important, so that's what I mean by it's important that with subsequent calls to a function that that night have maintained its state between calls. Meaning that after Starry has wielded, Main is going to turn and talk to Stormy for a while and it's very important that Starry is preserved so that when we turn back, Starry is in the same state as before. Okay, so that's what I mean by preserving state. So now, when I look at this function, or, or this, this sequence, and I have this get here, and is it important that it be me? Let's say that you asked me to get a random number, and then let's say later you asked someone else for a random number, and later you asked someone else for a random number. Is it important that it be the same person? No, as long as they're giving you a random number between 1 and 100, it doesn't really matter, right? There's nothing in me that's being preserved from use to use. So since there's nothing in my state that needs to be preserved, what makes wonderful sense is that it's just something that you create each time you need it. So that makes line 21 very compelling. Because every time you call the did you hit function, line 21 gets run, which means you could create a new random number generator. Let's look at the counter example here, and that is where Starry is interacting with the Lance. Starry asks the Lance to get stamina required and then asks the Lance, did you hit? Okay, And presumably there are values in that Lance that are worth preserving. You don't want the Lance's hit chance to change from invocation to invocation. Since we want that weapon's state to be preserved between calls, then we need something more pers persistent. And so as a result, we don't create weapons every time we need them. But up in here, we do that. So let me put another piece of data here. By virtue of putting the knight's stamina as private data, the knight's stamina is going to persist as long as the knight exists. Yes? As long as I put weapon in hand in the knight's private data, that weapon will persist until that knight goes away, which is what we want. So that's so this diagram tells us what talks to what 
but it doesn't give us a lot of information about, well, where do we create the thing to use it? And so now you have to ask questions about, do we need to preserve it from call to call? And if the answer is yes, make it private data. If the answer is no, just create it as a local variable. Any other questions on that? That was a long way of going to answer that question. I'm not even sure I answered it. There was something about weapon and private, and I just ran with it. All right, there've been there's been pretty good use of Piazza. I would encourage you to continue using that. I appreciate that because I get some students answering some questions, which is wonderful. I like that kind of cross pollination. Everyone's asking me for the secret word. When did I say this project was due? Thursday night, Friday, Friday. Okay, Friday, Friday morning. Okay, it, it's due. My yeah, there, there's a due date there on Blackboard. Don't ask me. Just see what it says. Uh, I have to give you a word of the day, and I totally spaced creating this. So let's see, what word could we use? Um, <sighs> I, I am without any creativity. I've used the last bit of it. Huh? Ferret out. I know it's two words, but I just looked it up. Ferret out. You guys all probably know that, but I didn't know what it was. Ferret out. I didn't know what it was. Yes, question. Thursday night? What did it say before? So what, Thursday at midnight, yeah? yeah? All right, yeah, that's fair enough. Uh, yeah, to ferret out, fine. okay, that's good. We'll, we'll use uh, ferret out as the word, or in this case, phrase of the day. Huh? There will be a space, so ferret space out. Uh, I will walk back to my office now and add that quiz, so it should be up in just a few minutes. All right, thanks a lot, we'll see.